Now a new series, there's only one Brian Moore. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to There's Only One Brian Moore. A celebration not just of the great man, but also of football and the big match in those halcyon days of the 70s. You remember the 70s, don't you, sir? Oh, yes, I can see you. In your flared trousers with your bubble perm. That's not a tank top you're wearing, is it? Well, take your mind back. It's 1972. You've just had your lunch. You're about to watch Randall and Hopkirk deceased. <laughs> Your mum brings you a nest quick when you hear this. And welcome again to the big match. And what a lunch we've got for you today. Brian Moore, icon to a generation, but it wasn't just the smooth tones and the sharp suits that made us love him. And hey, those suits were sharp, wasn't they? <laughs> it was the gifts he brought to our living room. Gifts like this. Payment again, playing with Crystal Palace, and Mary! To really one! An action like this from our second game this evening, West Ham versus Stoke City. Look at that for a pass, straight to Lampard. Near post cross going in. And it'll come for Lampard again, and he's hit that wall. But first tonight, we're going to look at Arsenal. Lucky Arsenal? Boring Arsenal? <laughs> well, not when this man was around. Charlie George. Right oh, Charlie George, you can hit him. My first guest, darling of the North Bank, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Mr. Charlie George. <laughs> Charlie, I have to ask, how long would you have lied there if no one had come and picked you up? <laughs> <laughs> the remaining uh, minutes of the game, probably. Yeah, there was that, how, how long was left, Charlie, at that point? About eight minutes, was it? Yeah. Possibly about eight minutes. And my next guest, ladies and gentlemen, one of the new breed of managers. Busby had his babes, Don Revy had his dossiers, but this man, he had the hairstyle. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Bond. <laughs> now, John, you played in a cup final, 1964? Yep. On the winning side as well, which was very nice. And managed on the losing side, unfortunately. I know which I, I, know which I like best. So tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be talking something about your days at Manchester City later. But first of all, I introduce my next guest, comedian. And it's lucky he's a comedian because he's also a West Ham supporter. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nick Revel. Nick, I don't think you're quite old enough to have seen John play in that cup final, are mm, you? No, no. But still a regular at West Ham? Uh, I can't go regularly because I get too excited and then I can't... <laughs> and then it, no, I do, I just shout too much when I'm there, so I, I go on stage and I'm oh, talking like... It like must this. be strange for you to be amongst so many people here after being at West Ham then. <laughs> yeah, but they're a nice bunch of people. And where are you from? <laughs> no. <laughs> Anyway, on to our first piece <laughs> on to our first piece of action, ladies and gentlemen. 1972. It's summer and Brian Moore is waiting us for a cracking game over at Highbury. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian Moore. <laughs> But first of all today, it's Highbury, where the reigning league champions are making a late run in defence of their title. Here against Derby County, such formidable opposition, Arsenal still able to leave out their striker, John Radford, though he gets the substitute spot. 
As for Derby County, just like the Arsenal, they have a very strong squad, and like Arsenal, having a good run as well. And they're now able to, able to leave Terry Hennessy out. He's their sub. Nelson, McClintock now to Armstrong. Quick forward for Kennedy. Ball and nice little touch there for Kennedy and a nice touch there for Kelly. And now Johnny George will get a shot. Armstrong was trying as well, but a lovely build-up and a miscue by John Robson on the far side. But lovely one-touch football by Arsenal. Durban breaking through, but uh, Nelson to Graham. And now Ball completely on his own on his left flank. Ball to Charlie George. He's putting some nice balls through this afternoon. Is uh, his most expensive football around ball. And Arsenal's throw. George Graham. Ball. A lovely little flick there again for Charlie George. Crossing towards the near post, and Armstrong was trying to get on it. But again, good defence by Derby County's Colin Todd. And Arsenal's corner. Armstrong with the corner. And a headed in against the post, though, by Charlie George. Well, he had none of the luck there. He completely slipped that Derby defence. Well, Sir Alf Ramsey showing no emotion. But the crowd at the moment getting behind Arsenal. There it goes. McGovern nodding this one away. Charlie George. McClintock to George. Hitting well. Will it come to Graham? Back again. And Bolton just scrambling it away. Now it's Hector at the other end. Very good burst of speed piece of goalkeeping by Wilson he flung out of this bearing arm a very difficult situation for Wilson but my goodness he did a tremendous job for Arsenal there the ball for Armstrong what a good ball flicked nicely by Armstrong wide of Gemmell wide now for Kennedy Rice has gone thundering down there for him Pat Rice beautifully played for him by Kennedy a chip now towards George Graham but not in the way following it in Charlie George going in with him and George getting it away and George evading some rather slicing tackles there some shirt pulling as well but the referee didn't like it calling Webster to him and Arsenal's free kick played half a minute of injury time although there's uh, as far as I can recall, there no injuries. Simpson with the kick. <laughs> Kennedy's head. And now O'Hare. Graham going in. Armstrong. Graham. A hard one across. Charlie George! Oh, and he's done it! On the stroke of half time! Charlie George! such a crucial one in this crucial match Kennedy holding that nicely back for Charlie George trying to lay one off now for Kennedy hitting it oh and that was a good save by the goalkeeper it may have looked like a bit of luck and in fact Bolton is in a lot of trouble and the whistle has gone McClintock's head again so dominant there at the back now Alan Ball still Alan Ball a lovely ball there for Ray Kennedy as well. Cross now again towards Charlie George and it was McClintock.
Parland at full stretch, who had to thunder that one behind for the corner. A little grim face there, Brian Clough. Now Armstrong. Onto that left foot and into the path of George Graham. Faced by Todd. Playing it for Armstrong again. Hitting one. Oh, and against the ball. Beautiful one, two again there with George Graham. One of his real specialities, and Armstrong so unlucky. Charlie George hitting one. Oh, and a marvellous save again by Bolton. Just a fingertip as that looked as though that must rocket into the top corner. Oh, and that got him going. Oh, and he still can't reach it. Like a man in a nightmare, the goalkeeper was trying to get that ball in the mud. And finally the whistle, rather than his own skill on that occasion, came to his rescue. Charlie George turned back for ball. Played on for Charlie George and he's all right. Down he goes and it's going to be a penalty. And it is a penalty and George is happy about that. So Colin Bolton, who's brought out one or two miraculous saves in this game, has got to do something now at 12 yards range from Charlie George. Behind the goal. And he's got it. 2-0. With seven minutes to go. Well struck and well out of the reach of Bolton. The final score then at Highbury is Arsenal 2, Derby County 0. Well, it's a game of three halves in this show, and we'll be back in the second half with big match analysis and sensational action from our second match this evening, West Ham versus Stoke City in 1975. Now, Pat. Hit low! My goodness, that very nearly crept in. Bonjour. Et soif, vous acceptez ma toile contre une bière C'est joli, c'est joli, mais. Bon, ben d'accord. Merci. Soothing, toning, cooling. Aftershave cooling gel, new from Lynx. After you eat, teeth are vulnerable to acid attack. Help fight back with mentadent bicarbonate of soda toothpaste. Try it, your teeth will feel brilliant. Drive into your mobile garage and pick up your Argos Premier Points. There's no tokens, no hassle, and no end of choice. As you may have noticed, the new 9,970 pound Volvo 440 has been restyled both inside and out. In fact, it has so many new features, it would seem a shame to spoil them. The new 9,970 pound Volvo 440, a car you can believe in. Cross at the crossing, wait for the night, go to bed. You can't be with them every minute, but you can always give them flora. Darling, be careful. If you go downtown, cause if I love you, then I need you, if I need you, then I want you around. Perming and colouring can leave our hair dry and dull, but I've learned how to make it look healthier with Pantene's new daily treatment system. First, prepare your hair with Pantene shampoo, then treat it with Pantene Pro Vitamin Conditioner. 
Pantene's Pro Vitamin Treatment goes deep into your hair as Pantene protects and conditions. Now my hair looks so healthy and it really shines. Pantene Shampoo and Conditioner System with Pro Vitamin, the daily treatment for healthy looking hair. Passé. Passé. Okay. Cliché. Obvious. Tedious. Frivolous. What a wuss. Speechless. Pepsi Max. Maximum full of taste and no sugar. Obsessed. Possessed. Impressed. No content. Live life to the max. Welcome back, everybody. I want to know, John, what did you used to say to the players at halftime? Apart from, get stripped, Kevin, you're on. No. <laughs> you really wouldn't like to know. <laughs> you really wouldn't like to know what I said at halftime on many, many occasions. In fair dues, halftime is probably the most important time from yeah. a manager's point of view because he may have to put a lot of wrongs to right at halftime and yeah. sort a lot of things out. So. A lot of constructive chat and has to Were you a rollicker? Were you throwing plates around the room or...? Didn't like losing. No. Didn't like losing. So if we were behind, obviously it, we had so to get things sorted out. Different players react to different methods is what you're saying, really. Yeah, you ha I mean, that's something that you have to learn as a manager, which is very, very difficult. I mean, yeah. if you... I know Charlie quite well and, and you have to deal with people yeah. like him and... and well, and, Charlie... <laughs> All Charlie liked to do at halftime was have a lie down, isn't it, Charlie? <laughs> I mean, I, I have to say, Charlie, you did like a lie down, didn't yeah. you? If you quite, can quite just, a lot. Just, just, just can't, watch can't this really for a moment. Armstrong with the corner. And a headed in against the post, though, by Charlie George. <laughs> well, he had none of the luck there. He completely slipped that derby defence. What was all that about, Charlie, all that line about... Oh. For the Christ of me, I don't know, honestly. <laughs> Just, uh, I think after 71, that was 72, it'd probably become a cult thing, I don't have... know. <laughs> we thought maybe a heavy night at Tramp the night before or something. Uh, no, never, never did things like that, I'm quite yeah. sure. So what was it like after the double that year? I mean, you'd signed Alan Ball, a British record transfer fee, £220,000. Did he make a lot of difference to the side? Um, well, it's hard to say, really. I mean, he scored more goals at Arsenal than any other club, funnily yeah. enough. Um, we never, we didn't win anything with Alan when Alan came there. Yeah. We obviously, you know, we're winning the double. Um, the manager thought that uh, he could uh, better the team, and mm -hmm. obviously, you know, he was a great player, play for England. And, John, uh, is it is it is it hard to get up after a season when you've won something? Is it hard to motivate the players again once you once you've won something? I don't know. I didn't win that much. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm just looking at those, that film now, right? It makes me realise what a good side the Arsenal were in those days. Yeah, you used to pass the ball in those days, Charlie, didn't you? Unfortunately, we're, I think they've always passed the ball, but yeah. uh, never really got the recognition they deserved. I mean, I mean you can see on those clips. Oh, come on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a word to the Arsenal fans now that they don't hear very often, midfield. <laughs> I must admit, I have to confess, I was, I was surprised by how entertain. I'm going to say it on television, how entertaining I found the Arsenal. I should take <laughs> a drink of water. <laughs> yeah, no, it can't be water. No, well, it was. It was. It was. It was, it was, it was a great, great game, wasn't it? I mean, they were really moving it around and. <clears throat> Not only a great ball. game, great incidents. Uh, Charlie, I'd like to look at your uh, second goal now, the the penalty, <laughs> and let's let's just talk over it as we watch it. Here we go, Charlie. You're away with the ball, and you go... <laughs> Never dived. Never dived. He had hold of, I think he had hold of my leg, actually. I think, I think it must have taken some time to recover from that injury. <laughs> <laughs> but Charlie nicely put away, very nicely put away. I think he had hold of my leg. I, never re I mean, I would never dive anyway. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> give <I> up. <laughs> What you didn't say, what you didn't see, they were all at the stand at the back holding up numbers. 8.6, 8.5. John, you must have worked with one or two divers in your time. 
<laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, not really. No, no, I, don't, I don't think that goes on in English football anything like... It used to. Like what it does in Italian football, yeah. for instance. And what about this thing about um, penalties at Liverpool? Is that true? Yes. Yes. That no one gets a penalty at Liverpool. Let's throw it to the audience. Is that true? Yes. yes. Yeah, Charlie, was that the case in your day? The cop might have had an influence on the referee, I don't know. Probably uh, he might have been a little bit frightened after the game if he hadn't given a couple of decisions their way, but um, I wouldn't have thought consciously. They, they never give penalties. No. Yeah, it's a funny place to go to, I'll tell you, as a manager. Yeah? It, th th none of these people will know that, obviously, but afterwards, if you are got beat, the boardroom is the best place in the world to be. They yeah. all get you drinks and chat to you. And I went there twice and we won 3-1 on both occasions. Yeah. They don't get you a drink and they don't talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, that's a fact. <laughs> Their bar bill must be a bit lower this season, mustn't it, actually? <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, let's um, look at your first goal now. Talk us through that, if you can. It's coming up now. Graham going to get George picked it up here and... Uh, Played it back out to Geordie who cut inside, you know, he seemed to be everywhere and George crossed it and uh, I just and guided it really. It. Just guided On it. The stroke of half -time, Charlie George. Well, the, I think most of the work was done on the ball, I mean, it, you just have and you to guide it there really. Yeah, so no lying, so no lying down after that one, that was good, but I think seeing here Charlie, I think you might have had a particularly heavy night the night before. <laughs> I wasn't lying on the floor, I was diving forward actually. I think we've got a, a clip of Alan Ball's signing on here. Can we have a look at this? It was the record you signing, £220,000. He said to give him £10,000 a year. We regard him as an absolutely supreme competitor who's capable of infecting other people around him. <laughs> Did Alan ever infect you with anything, Charlie? <laughs> Definitely not. The sideburns look well, actually, in the game, watching the game and the, uh, the and photo did, of him there. And you did develop some curly hair later in your career as well, didn't well, you, Well, I started Sean? off as a skinhead, a little bit like yourself, Tim, and uh, <laughs> it grew and grew, and then we had curls. Now, unfortunately, it's gradually going. <laughs> Nothing unfortunate about it, Charlie. I think it's very cool. <laughs> But why did you leave? Well, well, let's put this in perspective. You're with the double winning team, one of the best players in England has just signed, and you leave and you go to Derby. What was all that about? You're a London boy? Well, obviously, I wasn't in the team. Uh, the manager didn't pick me in the team, and then I wanted to play first team football, and I went to Derby. I, was the... I mean, I was, I was full, I mean, I'm an Arsenal supporter anyway, so I mean, I was fortunate enough to play for Arsenal after coming off the terraces, which I thoroughly enjoyed. No other London clubs interested at the time? Um, I was lined up to go to Spurs at the time with Terry Neal manager, and uh, it's only a job at the end of the day, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I think you lost a few fans there, <laughs> Charlie. We've got um, Sammy Nelson in the audience. Sammy, you're, what was the reaction in the dressing room when, when Charlie left? Have a please. No, I, I think there was a lot of disappointment amongst the, uh, the younger fellas, um, because we had sort of grown up together as apprentices and junior professionals and um, to see some, somebody of Charlie's talent leaving uh, was very hard to take in because we felt that the younger fellows coming through were going to replace the, the senior members of the double squad yeah. and carry on you know, for the rest of the 70s and into the 80s. But yeah. uh, it was just one of shock. So it was, it was hard to get yourself up again after Charlie had um, gone, really, and after well, the double years and everything? It was a bit, because Charlie um, damaged my cartilage. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say that Charlie damaged my car. Oh, he did that as well. <laughs> John, you know, you know a thing or two about strikers. I mean, you were often credited with bringing the fash news into the game. I signed them both on from a place called Attenborough, just outside of Norwich, and it was... Yeah. It, I have to say, and, and Charlie would know all about these, and Sammy, about Larry Lyde and, and Burnsy at, at Nottingham Forest. Yeah. And I played um, Justin Fashion in his first game against those two. <laughs> I'll tell you, he frightened the living daylights out of them. Yeah. I've never seen it happen on a football field before. <laughs> But they, they, it was a hard nut. 
um, Justin and John has just carried it on, hasn't he? I mean, the two of them are quite difficult characters. Yes, yes, that's right. And then, of course, you moved on to... <laughs> <laughs> then, of course, you moved on to Manchester City and you inherited a lot of players from, from Malcolm Ellison. What was your opinion of the staff Malcolm left you with at that time? Well, let me just tell you, we, I, I went there in about the end of October and they'd got four points from 11 games. They hadn't won a game that season. So I took over and Malcolm said, we're just ready to take off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then got a left back on the football, on the books at the football club. So there's Steve Daly, worth a million pounds one day, 250,000? 1.45 million, I That's right, him, yeah. yeah. I had a job to get 250,000 for him at the end. Why? Well, <laughs> you don't need to tell me, on the, me to tell you on this programme, do you? But, so, I mean, I, I was very fortunate because I bought three players when I went to Manchester City and they didn't cost that much money and I bought Tommy Hutch, who was absolutely magnificent. Yeah. And I bought... Bobby McDonald and I bought Jerry Gale, who would kick his grandmother, which worked very well. <laughs> <laughs> we had a good season. We, had a, we finished up about six in the table from four points when I took over and, and got to the Centenary Cup final. So that's, that's right. Good. And what a great final it was. It well. wasn't bad. It wasn't so good at the end because we got beat. Yeah. But uh, that's not the play. But to, I'm sorry to mention it, but to a great Ricky Villa goal. You mentioned. Uh, you you mentioned, thought it was great, did you? <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned Jerry Gow there. Who was the hardest player you ever played against? Uh, the Leeds United team, wasn't it? Uh, who particularly out of the Leeds team? Uh, well, probably Johnny Giles was probably the most fit. Johnny you know, Giles? Yeah. Uh, wouldn't you say, John? Yeah. I think so. yeah? yeah. Oh, because uh, anyone here, other hard players you remember? What about Paul Reaney? Paul Reaney was, uh, yeah, Paul Reaney was our player, but I think uh, if you speak to a lot of professionals yeah. that played the game, I would imagine Johnny Giles uh, could uh, quite look after himself very well. <laughs> well, he knew what he was doing, you see. It wasn't yeah. sort of to the ordinary punter looking at it. It was, wasn't really, really a blatant, but he used to know how to do you, that's for sure. Yeah. I'll tell you somebody who... <laughs> I'll tell you somebody who was quite... who I played with and then managed who was quite naughty when he wanted to be. Yeah? Was Martin Peters. Yeah. Believe it or believe it not. What, Martin well, left a foot in there again? West Ham and got, you know, bad habits yeah. in other clubs, you know. <laughs> yeah. He was a bit like that. You see, you, you don't think it about Johnny Giles, and he was very much like that, and you see Martin, and like, Martin would, he'd never forget. He'd say, just, just wait, and just bide your time. You, you must have um, seen the Leeds team at West Ham, Nick. I was brought up in near Leeds, so when I was a kid, I used to, I was kind of contra contrary. I used to support West Ham, uh, you know, in school and stuff mm. like that. But I used to go. You to were Leeds. in the Essex quarter <laughs> of Yorkshire. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Had to white socks. Had to wear white socks. And yeah. yeah. And um, except when you played football. No. Yeah. So I used to go to Leeds a lot in the early 70s. Yeah. And I think. Someone beat Chelsea 7 0 once in about 69 or something. No, like I that. think that's the strange water you're drinking. <laughs> oh, Leeds did? Leeds, oh, yeah. Right. I thought you said yeah. West Ham did. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 What? Oh, Only 7 0. I was confused about, about not pointing out that Leeds is in Yorkshire. I took that as a given, though, obviously. <laughs> Geography's and, not your strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> and Charlie, um, some great strikers at Derby, wasn't there as well? Derby had um, some tremendous strikers when I first joined them. They had Franny Lee, who was, you know, one of the best players I played with. Yeah. Um, Kevin X, who's a phenomenal goal scoring record, you know, unbelievable. Um, Alan Inton, who could, you know, crash a ball from anywhere. Yeah. Um, big Roger Davis come in and done a good job at times as well. Well, hang on, hang on, uh, Charlie, because we've got a film, not of a Roger Davis goal, but just have a look at this. <laughs> That mud was thick in the goal there, wasn't it? It was. <laughs> and you played with um, another man. We've got a picture of him. The one and only Derek Hales. Look at Derek here. <laughs> that do Derek a lot of justice, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, trivia question for the audience. Who's the own ma only man to score the double winning goal and then score an own goal from a penalty? Well, have a look at this. <laughs> It's a penalty, quite right. And you can argue all you like. Charlie George knows that there's no use arguing. Oh, can't hit it 
again. I said, oh, go! Charlie, can we... Uh... That was a dive in here, then. That was wrong end. Definitely the wrong end. Just talk us through it, Charlie. Here comes the penalty here. Yeah, I think David Armstrong took the penalty and... You're lurking on the edge of the box here. Yeah, I was trying to keep out of the way, but... Yeah, then, in uh... you go. Well, they all count, don't they? Head him to the floor again, now. Now, I think I know why you behave like that. Charlie, because you moved up north and players up north had some fairly eccentric habits, didn't they, John? If we have a look at this, you'll see just what I mean. This rare footage is all that's left to remind us of one of the most shameful spectacles of 1970s soccer, the white boot. <laughs> it's unclear exactly when they first hit the nation's grounds. For a long time, supporters believe men like Leeds fullback Terry Cooper here were just trying to be hard by playing in their socks. My boot wearers were easily classified. They were all northern and so had no sense of style. All of them had sold their credibility for just a £100 check from the manufacturers. Darby's Alan Hinton. At first, nobody cared about sad cases like him. They weren't concerned that players like Ian Story Moore here from Manchester United also fell victim. Despite switching to white boots and scoring a couple of decent goals, Storymore still failed to generate any interest whatsoever and took the desperate measure of dropping the story in a final attempt to make the papers. Fortunately, the white boot plague failed to reach the capital until 1972 when Arsenal signed unashamed white boot wearer Alan Ball from Everton. Steady, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> then London's players were threatened. It was only a matter of time before a real footballer fell victim. That luckless victim was double-winning skipper Frank McClintock. Shame. <laughs> the government acted quickly. The wearing, promotion, or even discussion of white boots was banned. McClintock spoke out about the whole sorry saga. It was a terrible mistake. I felt like a right prat. <laughs> <laughs> Never tempted, Charlie? Actually, I wore uh, red boots. Red boots? Yeah. Uh, they were from the same company, actually. And they never paid me. <laughs> <laughs> and Nick, what about you? Were you uh, ever, as a young man, a white boot person? Well, I think they would have looked better, those white boots, with a stiletto heel and maybe a leather pair of shorts, you know? <laughs> I think maybe then they could have cut it. I don't know. No, no. I think one or two players John managed probably did wear that particular outfit. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> now, now, Nick, you are, you, you're a bit of a fashion-conscious man, I can tell that. So give me your opinion on Brian's suit in this next clip. Let's have a look at it. Look at your letters as well. Happy today to reflect the increasing number that we're getting from Australia, where, of course, the big match is now seen this season. But first of all today, it's Highbury, where the reigning league champions are making a late run in defence of their title. And some crazy camera work there. Uh, Did you see that? I tell you, a couple of pints and you'd be a bit, a bit distressed by that thing moving around, wouldn't you? <laughs> there? Yeah, maybe, feel a bit sick. maybe they were trying to distract from the, the, the hairstyle. The trend-setting hairstyle, obviously, it's catching on, Tim. Yeah, it's catching um, on yeah. from me um, to Charlie, and it's heading your way. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Alan Ball syndrome, isn't it? <laughs> and also, it wasn't only uh, the way Brian looked that we loved. There was some fabulous commentary. I mean, listen to this. Oh, and that got him going. Oh, and he still can't reach it. A man in a nightmare. You're something of a poet, Nick. What did you think of that? Well, yes, I, I lost concentration on the game, you know, just waiting for the next stanza of that particular <laughs> piece. <laughs> I thought he was going to break out and sing there for a moment, like a man in a nightmare. I have to say, I think that they're a magnificent football club. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Lucky. You, can't, you cannot be lucky and keep winning things. No, you can't, no. In the last minute. <laughs> And it's something you won't see in this next game, because we've got our next match now. It's Christmas time, so Brian has got a day off from the studio. We've got Bobby Moore in the studio, and we're going to see West Ham versus Stoke from 1975. So, cue Bobby.
let's make a start with the main match, West Ham United and Stoke City, as we join Brian Moore at Upton Park. Thank you, Bobby. Well, here we are on your old stamping ground. Welcome to Upton Park, and for this West Ham side, it's such an important game. A blow for West Ham, their midfield star, Trevor Brooking, is out of the side. As for Stoke, no problems at all. They are unchanged. Aided by Pack. Adams cross. Too high for Fidget. No, it wasn't. Got up at the last there before the ball fell to Alan Taylor. A free kick, surely, yes. A foul by Jeff Salmons. Clumsily into the back of Alan Taylor. And already it's taken. Oh, and that was a nasty old clumsy challenge as well between Fidget and uh, McDowell. to West Ham. That might be having a quiet word with the referee or maybe it was the other way around. Now Keith Coleman. There's the cross going in and it's a good one too and Jennings was right in there. He really is dynamite when the ball's in the air, Billy Jennings. A fairly frail figure but he gets up so well and got a lot of power with that header. But wide again. Tommy Taylor's come up to the edge of the box as well. Played short, this time for Lampard, getting a different angle on it. Curled in first time there, and Alan Bloor missed kicking. Tommy Taylor can play it back to Keith Coleman. Changed his mind very effectively there. Now he's got the angle for a cross, for Keith Robson to chase, and Billy Jennings to head, and away! Crossed in by Coleman. Robson somehow acrobatically got it there and it eluded the Stoke defenders and Jennings rose superbly into the back of the net. West Ham won, Stoke City nil, 28 minutes gone. Billy Jennings, the scorer, goal number four for him this season. Stoke City get a free kick. himself. My fellow who is a good uh, 18 inches taller than he is, Tommy Taylor. So the lines will get into the show of the first place. David Edmonds is going to have his way. It's Hudson curling it into the far post. And it's there! Scored by Bloor. And Alan Bloor, the man who gets the equaliser for Stoke City. As Hudson lifted that one in, Bloor Got above the West Ham defenders. Past Mervyn Day, West Ham won, Stoke City won. And Alan Moore gets his second goal of the season, a fellow who's been with Stoke for 17 seasons. McDowell. Crossed in again deep towards Keith Robson on the far side. And Jimmy is there! another two or three yards yet. Deaf ears. <laughs> and the referee, I'm sure, is saying, look, unless you go back, I shall have to book you. So they've grudgingly given him a yard. So Salmons and Hudson and Greenock are all there. Salmons playing it right through, and somehow Mervyn Day just got there and turned it past the post because the ball went over for a corner. Salmons eventually the man who hit it, and it took quite a wild deflection there in the wall. And Day just got down to save an equaliser. Alan Taylor. Oh, look at Coleman's run here. Nice chip, Kenter. Billy Jennings, a hat-trick! A beautiful piece of running by Keith Coleman. All on his own on the touchline. A beautifully measured cross. Billy Jennings on mark, and he doesn't miss them like that. West Ham 3, Stoke City 1. And that's 
and the hatchet man, Billy Jennings. Alan Taylor on the far side. Patton wanting it back again. Oh, that's a good shot. And number four for Jennings. No, oh, the whistle's gone. The flag was up, the whistle had gone. Well, that was a furious drive there by Taylor. And a bad mistake by Peter Shilton, letting it slip through his fingers. And it looked for a moment as though Billy Jennings might have got number four. But he was offside. Coleman to McDowell. What about that for a pass? Look at that for a pass. Straight to Lampard. Near post cross going in. And it'll come for Lampard again. And he's hit that well. Beautiful bit of play. Superb pass from McDowell. All of 45 yards that Lampard was able to take into his sky. And when it came back to him, thrashed it just over the crossbar. Well, it's a win that'll do West Ham's morale a lot of good after their recent run of four results. And there goes the final whistle. And West Ham worthy winners, there are the two scorers again. Billy Jennings, the hat-trick man on the right. A final scoreline then at Upton Park. West Ham 3, Stoke City 1. Time for our second half-time break, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be back in the second half with big match analysis. But I'd like you to look at this, sir. Do you know who this is? And we'll be seeing action like this. Bobby Killard, right in that goal mouth there. The corner coming up and Bond's going for it. And Kuka, he scored! Razor, sir? Yeah, a free Bic Razor. Buy one of these delicious hot breakfasts and get a new Bic Razor free. Soothing, toning, cooling. Aftershave cooling gel, new from Lynx. Timote Honey Shampoo, even the weak and fragile can be transformed into an astonishing display that looks full of strength and health. Timote Honey, suggested by nature, perfected by Timote. Welcome to the Intercity GTI. Papa. City. Papa. Uh, Papa. Nicole. I thought you said you weren't married. Now you're motoring. Which new detergent does Indesit recommend, even in the rapid wash? Short answer, Indesit only recommends Ariel to wash really clean. Important. Hello? Oh, it's for you, Mr. Harkin. Hello? You've been thinking about me, haven't you? Uh, yes. Sorry, it's my mother. Oh. Picture me, condensation running down my sleek sides. Imagine tweaking my ring pull. Oh, you little minx. Yes! You want my appleness bubbling on your tongue. Say it to me. Apples. Louder. Apples. Louder. Big juicy apples. Dagnummy. If apple seduction is taking over your life, call. Hey. Wow.
Welcome. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just finishing my delicious Upton Park pie there. <laughs> <laughs> you, sir, did you um, get the result of our teaser at the beginning of the break there? Easy, wasn't it? Because he hasn't changed a bit, has he? Ladies and gentlemen, Billy Jennings. Billy, we've watched those goals, and it takes me back to when I was at school. When you were at school, you had the fat bloke in goal, you had the big lad at the back, and you had the little sharp lad up front who is what we call a goal hanger. <laughs> Come on, Billy, you were a goal hanger, weren't you? I suppose I was, being honest, yeah. I didn't yeah. like chasing back too often. Let's have a look at two of your goals, and perhaps you'd like to talk us through them. Now, yeah. I don't know where you are just now, Billy, probably lurking somewhere. Here you are. Goal hanging. Hey. That's it. <laughs> Lucky you didn't put that one over the bar, really, Billy, wasn't it? So, can you talk us through this, Bill? Well, John Mottdale's knocked it across to Kiefer Upson. Yeah. And he's just knocked it into the danger area there, and I've just got on the end of it, really. And in you come. And, and we've got another one coming up now. And there you go. Oh! Now, can we... That was a great goal, Billy, but can we look at Peter Shilton here? Was he such a great goalkeeper? I mean, over it. Um, where was Shilts? I think he either said, where was the marking? I where, think... where was the marking and where was Shilts? OK, John, a scenario for you. Your team goes in at half-time having not marked Billy in the box like that. Rollicking? I'd have had that number two round of throw. Yeah? <laughs> no, no danger. I'd have had him pinned against the wall, wondering what he was... I... <laughs> My grandmother would have scored that goal. <laughs> <laughs> he stood there in that penalty area, all on his own, the full-back is like, oh, go on, Bill, do what you like. <laughs> but it was a happy club at that time, the Happy Hammers. Billy, tell us about some of the characters. I was quite new at that time, but uh, we had a few characters, yeah. We had Tommy Taylor. Tommy Taylor, yeah. yeah. He used to bully the little guys. Yeah. I.e. me and a few others. <laughs> in all what in way? Good fun, all in good fun. If you beat him at cards, you know, you might get a, a pinch or a dig on, on the bus. <laughs> well, you had Keith Robson, didn't you? How did you... Two tearaways together, him and Billy, weren't they? I mean, yeah. you, if you knew Keith Robson... Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> I bought him at Norris for peanuts, but what a, what a handful. Well, yeah. he didn't know what he'd be doing next, both on and off the field. <laughs> yeah, we piled up, me and Keith, because we were the only two single lads in the side at the time. Yeah. Um, but he was, he was a lovely lad. He'd come down from the northeast and... Uh, down to the bright lights. And uh, he had a good time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think you showed him a good time, Keith. <laughs> well, I was allowed to, and I wasn't married. Yeah. And so, Billy, there was, there was yourself, there was Keith, out for nights on the town. There were some good-looking lads around then, but not all. I mean, Nick, um... What? Let's take what, what, what? You, let's... Get off, you get off the subject of good-looking lads and you talk to me? What? Yeah, I don't what? know what happened, Nick. It, it came... I, I don't know what... Th this man that we're going to look at in the clip now. Uh, first of all, a characteristically dirty foul. And then we have to say an ugly mug. <laughs> Looks like uh, the guy from Simply Red gone through some horrible genetic experiment, doesn't it? <laughs> Mike Hedgick, ladies and gentlemen. Who remembers Mike? Anyone oh, remember yeah. Mike? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. just over there in the corner, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you ever been kicked by Mike? Yeah, Mike was uh, quite a solid player. Yeah, he did quite a good job. A solid player. I think we know what that means, Charlie. <laughs> and John, you played for West Ham, of course. How many years were you at West Ham, John? Nineteen. Yeah, nineteen years. And why, why no, did you never manage a, a London club? Because <laughs> they didn't want me. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I like you would have done. West Ham. You'd have come? I'd have, yeah, I'd have gone. I'd, I mean, I went to Norwich and it was magnificent and I went... Do you think Kevin would have made the move as well? <laughs> John's joking. <laughs> That's the thing. Over the years, West Ham have had lots of heroes. Let's take a look at two of them now. At the start of the 70s, black players were almost unheard of in the English league. It was West Ham who introduced two of the first black terrace heroes. The first was Bermudan striker Clyde Best. Taylor doggedly trying to stay with Billy Bonds. Bonds a little cross and Clyde Best the goal! Clyde Best scored 58 goals in seven years at West Ham, firmly establishing himself as an Upton Park Terrace hero. 
best was the archetypal English centre forward, a big, sometimes clumsy target man whose finishing ability made up for what he lacked in skill. When he wasn't scoring, best bulk often did enough to make opportunities for others. Since retiring, Clyde has moved to California and, quote, put on three stone. <laughs> on this evidence, he must now weigh about 23 stone. <laughs> Season 71-72 saw Best joined by A.D. Coker, a 17-year-old from Nigeria. Coker was very much Clyde's opposite, a fast, slight and skillful player. He made a dazzling start and saved his best for the TV cameras. But sadly, this early promise faded and Coker played just 10 games over two seasons, scoring three goals before moving on to Lincoln City. Yes! Eddie Coker! The two young 1976, he left England to play in America, where he now lives. Despite his very limited career, the name of A.D. Coker is still fondly remembered by the West Ham faithful. A.D. Coker and Clyde Best there. Billy, did you know either of those two fellas? I made my debut with uh, Clyde Best. Really? Yeah, and uh, I disagree with you. He had a lot of ability, he had a lot of skill, Clyde. Yeah? He was a big guy and it was, he was a great target man, but he had good touch as well yeah. for a big guy. Yeah, he was good to play off. Oh, terrific. I mean, when he left, I, I tended to have a role up front a lot more on my own and we not noticed have, yeah. well. <laughs> and not have the support of a big guy which yeah. is difficult you know yeah. but he, he was good to play with yeah john did you ever uh, have anything to do with Clyde? no no i was only used to just go and watch him play because i lived just around the road from him yeah when i keep looking at all those clips and the thing that strikes me is the marking i can i mean i just happen to think that a lot of football in the past like maybe in charlie's era and, and, and things like that was every bit as, what it, as good as what it is today, maybe better. But certainly, the marking is better today. The mark, yeah. I mean, you, you, they, you couldn't score goals like that today. But what about the general level of skill? I think the skill factor is not... I don't think it's as good, but the, the game is played at, a, you know, 100 mile an hour. Mm. Now, I mean, looking at those clips there, you're going back 20-odd years, I mean, it's, it looks like walking pace compared to the way they play. So now. you had more time in those days? Well, yeah, that, it, it seems to be that way, just watching the clips, but, um, you know, good players will always make space for themselves. Yeah. Um, but today, you have to be some type of athlete to play, I should imagine. We yeah. were talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> that says everything, doesn't it? <laughs> we were talking about it in the, in the room before we came in, and I said to George, uh, Charlie, um, I played 19 years, and I look at them play now, and I wonder whether I could have played. Yeah. And he said exactly the same thing. He said, it, it makes me wonder because of all the hard work and all the running they do. And yet I played alongside a, a fullback who was as quick as anybody you want to see. It was a fellow named Noel Campbell. Mm. And so I, I have to believe somewhere along the line that, that we still could play, but it, it boggles my mind sometimes when I see how much effort and so much hard work is put into the you game. You notice now. now with the players as well, the upper body, they're very big. <coughs> they obviously, Billy, the training has changed, do you think? Yeah, they seem... They seem pumped up a lot to me. Yeah. Uh, I don't go a lot to watch football these days, but uh, I watch it on TV. But to me, from the outside looking in, they all seem like they're working out a lot yeah. more. And they're getting a lot of physical bulk, which, mm. well, not many of us had when I was playing. Mm. You were often described as a frail figure. Yes. yes By Brian. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could cut it in today's Premier League, actually, myself. I have to confess that, you know. Mm. I don't think you could cut it in a pub Sunday league. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you'll probably notice we've been talking a lot about West Ham tonight. But we haven't mentioned Sir Trevor. He was the god, wasn't he? He was uh, John, Trevor Brooking. He, he was a great, great player, Trevor. I'm afraid he didn't come alongside Bobby Moore, but he was a great, great player. Well, let's have a look. Cross first time there towards first at the far side, but again, McFarland's head was there. Brooking, still Brooking. Yes, Trevor Brooking! No mistake about that one! 
Five men forward for West Ham. Jennings jumping well and Brooking going in. 1-0!